Take note of Marlon Williams. This is the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy. And Marlon Williams happens to be a 27-year-old singer from New Zealand whose latest album, Make Way For Love, came out earlier this year. He's well known in his home country for his work with a band called The Unfaithful Ways and for his Secret History of Country Music songwriting series with Delaney Davidson. But if you are listening in the United States of America, you might know his song Dark Child, written by his friend Tim Moore. And it is a positively chilling song that was used quite effectively at the end of the first episode of the Netflix series Wild Wild Country. He's also well known in his country for his romance with singer Aldous Harding, a singer who he's no longer romantically involved with, but who he nevertheless invited to sing on a song he wrote about their breakup. But it all began for Marlon Williams when he joined the choir at about age 10. He says he liked it easier than math. Which I point out because his New Zealand accent makes it sound a little bit like he's saying it's easier than a certain drug. Which, to be fair, is also true. Music is easier than math. Anyway, we'll let him tell the story. Uh, that was the first time I thought I can get away with doing this. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, you know, this is kind of like easier than math. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it that reached out to you that made you um it's it's the ease of communication you know it's i i don't know i was always a very mumbly um you know almost stuttery child and i never found like i could communicate anything very very simply and except through music you know just especially that the first approach of having notes written on a page in front of me and and you know, and just and reciting, and in a sense, that there was there was a real, yeah, it was just a, it was a real sort of, you know, I get a breath of fresh air to be able to uh, communicate that way. Yeah, and, and was there, uh, you know, education to? You, you said the notes in front of you. I mean, mm. a lot of people don't start with the notes in front of them. That was I'm jumping the gun there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, you know, it was it was definitely. Definitely, uh, you know, physically taught to me first, uh, and then, and I actually, I remember, I didn't, uh, I didn't take to, actually, to music, to notes on the page for quite a long time, mm-hmm. actually, because it, I don't know, I had some sort of sense of breaking the spell, you know. I mm-hmm. think it, a lot of, a lot of uh, musicians who come to it naturally have that battle. But, right. Yeah. Right. And, and how about like in the family? Was was music always around and in your neighborhood? And yeah, it was uh, definitely in the family. It was my dad was a a musician, who, but he you know largely stopped, except you know around the house. Yeah. Um, by the time I was around, so and my mum always is a painter and always listened to you know a lot of classical music and and uh, really loudly while she's painting. So yeah. It was always in the home. Who who were the first artists that drew you in? Um, I remember buying uh, buying my first piece of music for myself at a garage sale next to my grandma's place. I bought a just randomly bought a uh, just a like a seven inch of uh, Sound and Vision by David Bowie, and and just having that that piece of music that was mine for the first time was you know a really a really amazing feeling. Um, so yeah, there was. Then I and I didn't listen to any more Bowie for another you know ten years probably, but that was a, a weird spike in my Bowie, you know, life. Um, but but I think I think definitely a lot of the early Elvis records that my dad played a lot, and all all of the Beatles records were you know they were the sort of the mainstay of the house. Uh huh. And so you're at this point you know probably ten or eleven, mm. and and when when do you start playing? Um, it came pretty soon after, you know, I, uh, I think Dad introduced me to Dylan and then I picked up a guitar and played Blowing in the Wind and and uh, and tried to take a few lessons with the guitar but found it pretty frustrating, so yeah, just, you know, basically just, yeah, just needed something to have, to be a beard while I sang, you know, yeah, and that was, that wasn't what I was getting from my <laughs> classical guitar right. lessons. Yeah, so you're, it, it, meanwhile, 
taking classical guitar mm. and what made you decide to go that way rather than just take regular rock guitar lessons or something that was the only option really at, at my school yeah wow. it, I, you know it was, a, it was a small school there were about 100 kids uh -huh. at my elementary school so it was you know that was it was very limited in terms of uh the scope yeah that's interesting mm. so then I, I just love the anecdote that your first band involved your friends and your science teachers yeah that absolutely true it's true it's true it's more true than you think we had a, yeah we had, it was yeah me and Ben who's still playing bass with me now yeah it's in the other room um and and my other friend and first of all we had a uh just a general science teacher named Nick Ward who was playing drums for us and then he left and then we got another science teacher really yeah that's hilarious yeah who was a biology teacher so how did, I don't know why that is how did that all come about well I don't know. There was the the science department at the, my high school was really I don't know. They were all closet musicians and yeah, and it was just one of those anomalies. You know? Yeah, and, and what was the common ground uh, for music that you shared there? What who were some of the artists you um, guys looked to? Well, by that, that that's you know by that time I'm I was about fourteen or so and mm -hmm. fourteen fifteen and, and I was really uh, my my dad had put a a grand pass in the CD in front of me so. And I, it took me a while to warm to it, but when I did, it was, I don't know, it, it was just when I was really starting to get a feel for trying to write, too. Mm -hmm. And just something about, yeah, the simplicity of country music just seemed like an an obvious medium to, to jump into, you know. Was it that double one, the GP, Grievous yeah, Angel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's a great intro. Totally, yeah. yeah. It's like, a, you know, it's a gateway drug into yeah. country music. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's interesting, too, because listening to your, your early recordings and, and hearing how country they are, mm. I wondered kind of who were the people you were looking to in New Zealand and, and who, you know, I imagine, you know, Hank Williams and Graham Parsons mm. and that kind of thing. But how were you exposed to all that music? Um, well, it was all, you know, it was really through my dad, just constantly every week bringing home a new album, a, mm. new, a new CD that he'd go and trade in for the next one, you know. And it, and as he saw that I was getting into the country stuff more, that was, you know, that became more of a, the mainstay. Mm -hmm. um, and, yes, yeah, and it... From yeah, I went back to Hank Williams and George Jones, and and then really into bluegrass, you know, by my mid teens. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about uh, your musical relationship with your dad. Did you guys play together at all? Or yeah, did... we we played and we um, <clears throat> you know, did some really. I actually I I did this like high school band competition with my band, The Unfaithful Ways, and I I I submitted the song for like the best song category that my dad had written and I just well he'd sort of written most of it and I just tailored it off mm -hmm. I still haven't credited him to, to, for it to oh, this no. day and I'll probably get in trouble with does he know it. he knows yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah but uh you know it's it was definitely uh yeah we were very uh it was our common language you know it's, yeah you know, we're not a, not a super uh talkative you know, duo as a lot of fathers and sons aren't. Right. But, but that was, uh, you know, that was the emotional connection that That's we got. That's great. And so during the whole uh, Unfaithful Ways was what, five, six years? Yeah, it was from about 15 to 21. Uh-huh. Yeah. And talk to me a little bit about uh, that that uh, arc. At that point, did you know this is something I'm going to do for a long time? Or at, yeah. at what point in that band's lifespan did you make the decision, all right, this is something I'm going to really work hard at? Um, <clears throat> I never really did. You know, it was yeah. it was something that, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell because I, I, I'm really bad. Like, I'm constantly reinventing my own past. Okay. But I'm pretty sure that it was, there was never a moment where I thought that this is gonna be a, the, the goer, you know, it, it just felt like it from, just that, com that comfortability from, from the, you know, singing the choir for the first time was a no-brainer, you know. Just, right. Yeah. And, and so your you know, Unfaithful Ways stopped at what, you're 17, 18 or? Tw no, 21, 21 you said. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So at that point you were, when when in the trajectory you, you had mentioned earlier you were interested in looking at berkeley college of music for conducting yeah. and 
so where, <coughs> where was that that was that was around the end of high school yeah yeah it was um i was seeing an american girl really yeah yeah who uh ended up at yale but uh oh okay i thought you said i was singing american girl oh no no, 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 like, no okay that's like interesting <laughs> okay, I, yeah. I did not picture really this. hear picture that this. in in your music but okay <laughs> you were seeing an american i was seeing girl. an american girl yeah and she would because she came over on exchange to yeah. christchurch yeah and then uh she moved home and i was and you know i wanted to I wanted to study music, I, I thought, and and obviously there's you know incredible music schools over here, Berkeley being one of them, and um, and yeah, and and you know all through high school I've been, you know, uh, joining joining choirs and was uh, had just just come back from a tour of Europe with a uh, with the Cathedral Choir, and I don't know I just developed a real passion for the whole choral, uh, you know universe so uh and conducting seemed like a uh, uh some sort of romantic dream that i that i'd like to pursue yeah it's an interesting double life too with the different types of music does mm. the i i haven't in the music i've heard i mean i i hear the harmonies the really sweet harmonies but i never hear you know these this uh, choir this, mm. uh, this sort of influence in, in your work does yeah. it ever come out or it do you keep I, it separate I think it's I feel like it's uh, you know it's amalgamated into just the way I sing a mm -hmm. bit and uh, especially live you know it's uh, it, it's more of a more of a thing that I just slip into when I'm in a studio I you know I'm trying to craft an album and and it's more considered but it, when I let loose it seems to really creep back in right yeah. right right and and you know we'll probably get to this a little bit later but yeah w with both of your solo albums you can definitely hear you know a, a conscious mood that was created and it, it's definitely confined within its its certain mm. it, it's its vision and it doesn't seep beyond that which is a good thing you know i mean you don't want an album that's gotta, all over the place yeah you gotta keep it relatively tidy right right so um, then uh, the uh, Unfaithful Ways, so mm. that's what it's called, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> um, so that, it, how does that fall apart? Well, or how do you it was disband? Our guitar player moved to Berlin. Yeah. Um, I'd started working with another guy named Delaney Davidson. Mm -hmm. And we were still playing as a band when, when he and I went and recorded our first duo album. Mm -hmm. And that's just sort of, uh, and I was starting to play a lot solo, just around, you know, around the city. Um, so yeah, just it just sort of naturally started drifting off into something else. Right. How how did you two meet? We met because I, we were both asked to play this show that a friend of ours was playing and couldn't play, mm -hmm. and he just sort of cast his net too wide and, and asked us both to to cover the the set at at, the, at this local bar. And mm -hmm. I'd heard of Delaney. Um, you know, on and off, but but he's he'd been touring Europe for the last twelve years or something. So never met him, and the first time we met was both turning up to play this show mm -hmm. and going, ah, oh, Adam's done that thing again that he always does. Yeah, and um, and then we worked out. We were like, well, let's just you know, I know who you are, you know who I am. Let's see if we can just play a show together. And so we ended up doing three hours of just you know all of our favorite songs, and oh, that's great. Found that we had so many of them in common. And he's a little bit older than you, too. Yeah, right? he's yeah he's got a you know, ten years or so on me. Yeah, and how did the project? Uh, you guys did four albums together, mm. right? Uh, uh, yeah, three. Three. three okay. Yeah. So, and what is it? It's like history of country. Sad but true. The yeah. secret history of country music yeah. songwriting. Yeah. How did uh, <laughs> that whole project come about? Oh, at what point did you guys? Uh, from that playing that first set together mm. come to that sort of collaboration um, well he, he's a he's an extremely proactive person and I'm not yeah so it came from him saying why don't we do this thing yeah you know and, and it was but it was based around the ethos of that night you know it's like this just this drawing together of uh, you know of all these different parts of both of our musical histories and and uh, and finding some synthesis um, and yeah so it just I, but there was the day the first day we met to talk about making that album the first album we were sitting in a in a cafe 
with a you know with a piece of the book in front of us and we're writing things down and, and I remember he'd just written down ghosts of country music on this piece of paper and then we had a big earthquake that just struck out of nowhere <laughs> and at, at the time you guys were meeting just at, at the time we were wow. meeting and it you know was a very a really serious one you know people died wow. and it was a the whole city was demolished you know to, wow. a, to a degree so so it was a pretty auspicious way to begin what, what year is that 2011 wow yeah and so and then we finished recording the first album exactly a year after to the day after that that first meeting after you know a crazy year of dealing with a broken city and yeah and uh and making a we made a uh, like a charity album in between that to with us and a whole bunch of friends and then but yeah then a year later on we we had our first first album out i remember it now mm. it was it was a big big yeah, like, yeah the, it, the whole city was destroyed yeah, right totally the cbd was ruined you know speaking as a musician 70 percent of the venues were gone really yeah so it just turned into a, like a house party town you know wow so yeah, what what happened after that? Did have they been rebuilt since? Or it's still you know like my mum's house is still, you know when we're, we're seven years on now. Yeah, mum's house is still being rebuilt slowly. Wow, that's yeah, it takes a long time to recover from something like that. Yeah, and um, you still call Christchurch home? Yeah, it's the nearest thing I've got at the moment. Yeah, yeah. well because yeah, you're on the touring yeah, as much as totally i spent possible. a month there at christmas and yeah I'll, you know i'll probably get a few weeks there in june yeah so after that you were playing down there still a lot mm. and um when you, you've toured america before right mm. yeah so when when in this whole uh when, when you were collaborating with delaney did you at that point say this is what i'm doing for my life or no, I'm, no, there's still no point. You know, there's <laughs> yeah. no. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I don't. I'm not one for uh, yardsticks or. Yeah. You know, it's just sort of. I sort of go along with, with whatever's happening. Right. What What was your fallback if you wouldn't be doing music? Well, I went. I went to university. Yeah. And uh, in Christchurch, I stayed yeah. home. Uh, around yeah, around the time of the earthquakes, so or just afterwards, and and uh and studied history, and. I was, you know, I'm very passionate about um, about New Zealand history, and you know, I've got a indigenous background too. So I oh, cool. was studying studying Maori, yeah. Maori language, and what um, um, I, I don't know a way to say this without sounding ignorant, but what what, what tribe or yeah. what? Uh, <clears throat> so the Maori people are, you know, sort of a general, in the same way that you, um, you know, you'd say. Native Americans. It's mm -hmm. just a general sort of uh, Western bracket of uh, of tribes. Yeah. That for simplicity's sake. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you done any musical connection to those roots at all? Yeah, there was. That's another thread that was always running through my childhood too. You know, there's a really strong. A lot of the cr the sort of croonerisms that, yeah. are, that, are, that are in me are from that, as as well as the classical stuff. You know, it's it's a, it's a real. Um, you know, unashamed openness to the singing style. Uh -huh. Are there any traditional songs that you play still? Or, or? I do from time to time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's, you know, if it's if it feels appropriate or funnily inappropriate, then yeah. I'll, <laughs> I'll bust well, give, one out. Give me an example of a funnily <laughs> inappropriate time that you've. I, I made my girlfriend sing sing this one Maori song with me in Montreal last year. Yeah. For no reason other than that we've been singing, we'd like sing, tried to learn around the house. Yeah. And she just didn't know any of the words. And she's, I mean, it's all in, you know, just like two part harmony, the whole song. And she's just like fiendishly trying to phonetically read my lips. Yeah. And just this, this like, <laughs> just like absolute gibberish coming out of her mouth. And oh, me, great. and me just losing it and not being much better. So, but we're in Montreal. No right. one's going to know. Right. So we're just, harping at each other right and, and she's from new zealand as well right yeah, yeah 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 and um she's also the subject of this yeah. song uh, the whole album yeah, much, yeah. right and I, I need to hear the story about how on earth you approached her about singing on a song about breaking up with mm, her <laughs> yeah how did that happen well we we she and i have a musical history that 
extends back to when we were about 16 or 17. Okay. And I don't know, I guess we sort of, we fell in love through that. You know, that was, we, we, were, we were with other people and we, but that was our, I don't know, that was our sort of place where we could, you know, connect with each other. Mm -hmm. So it was, and we didn't, we didn't get together until, you know, six years, six or seven years after that. So it was, that was such a strong thread anyway. And all, all throughout our relationship, there was this un respect and understanding of, you know, of what each other does and, and goes through. And yeah, and that was, it was a real, a real uh, challenging and, and, you know, like artistically fruitful sort of dynamic to have, you know, right. to be pushing each other, but, but quite hard, you know, when right. you're both treading the same sort of ground. So it was really... I didn't feel weird about it at all, you know, it's very natural, you know, yeah, very natural uh, sort of combination and, uh, and I've really just, I needed it. I think it was, I just needed needed her to, some part of me needed her to accept my version of events. Right. You know? And she saw that and whether or not she agrees with the sort of tone behind the song, it's, you know, she was willing to come to the party. Is, is there uh a counter an answer song that you're going to guest on for her? <laughs> <laughs> no you know it's, it's there's uh i don't know we're, 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 we're talking about doing other stuff together yeah but um yeah that's so, funny that it's like everybody was wondering like what's jay-z gonna do after lemonade you know <laughs> yeah 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 there's a sort of this implied uh narrative isn't right there? right this is the, the history of response songs yeah. and whatnot <laughs> But being in a relationship with somebody who is a songwriter, uh, I'd imagine there are songs you can point to that you're like, that's about me. It's got to be about me. Yeah. I or mean, did you guys not, <clears throat> did you discuss that sort of we thing? Ne we never discussed it. Yeah. You know, but like, I mean, I've tried to bring it up with her once and she just gave me this look like, dude, come on. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, but you know, it was, we were like that, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about her music. And right, right, just right. like you know, I don't want to try and like put my needle on it. But but we're very much in each other's lives, and you know, she, right. and she made that incredible album. Yeah. So it's you know, I, I, I definitely you know, it's it's an interesting thing to listen to someone's music and you know, but because we all do that with songs, right? We all go, oh, it's it's about me, and it's like, but to like really, I don't know, it sort of throws a whole other kind of level on it. I was always hoping there would be like. Uh, a day an appointed day via social media where you would have to send songs you had written to everybody you've written about them and <laughs> you know it'd be like hashtag song about you or something wow. like that. wouldn't that be amazing that'd be that'd be chaos <laughs> yeah I think that it, it would be that, it, that would bring about the, the end of days I think. <laughs> so your collaboration with Delaney mm. how did that um, wrap up or decide that or, or did you guys keep it open and mm. say you know maybe we'll come back to this yeah there's still there's still a um, intention to keep it open and see what happens you know mm -hmm. we're about to go on tour with each other in a couple of weeks oh cool in Europe. oh that's great yeah and we haven't you know we haven't played together for a long time but it, it just sort of Delaney was going back to Europe to tour and I uh, the opportunity and sort of desire to move to Melbourne in Australia came up with me and my girlfriend at the time, and I had the off, you know, I had an offer of management. Should I move there? And it just seemed like a natural step. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of worried of a uh, post earthquake Christchurch, and mm. and uh, and had done a lot of touring up and down the country. And it's you know, it's only only so big, so mm -hmm. Australia seemed like an obvious option for me at that point. Right? Yeah. Is it what? What is the difference in scene? in from uh, Christchurch to Melbourne <coughs> I mean I imagine it's huge but mm. as somebody who's never been to either of those places yeah I read about them and listened to the music from each place yeah well you know Melbourne is about about the same size as New Zealand so yeah. it's like and it's and it's got you know still it's still got one of the most you know after all the touring I've done it's got one of the biggest and sort of most self-sustained music scenes I've seen it was very eye-opening eye for me, you know, to go there and just have these, especially after the earthquakes, have all these venues on every corner, and and there'd be a lot of lot of really good infrastructure around it, um, and and internal support. 
I always am curious when I speak to musicians from you know countries that I've never actually mm. been to uh, about well you know here I am in Boston and, and you're in Boston right now and you might have like picked up just listening to the radio like hearing tons of Aerosmith in this area you know? yeah 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 so who were the heroes of New Zealand the, the only ones I can think of are like split ends yeah right? crowded and house crowded house and the, the Finn brothers the Finn brothers yeah yeah, yeah they were, I don't know it was I was I was so caught up in my own little world you know that of uh try, of just dissecting all the stuff that and digesting the stuff that that uh that was coming in, coming to me and and then just people from my own you know my peers my immediate peers a lot of the, there's you know there's a really uh strong sort of uh garage lo-fi scene from the 80s with uh, flying nun records which was a you know an incredible incredible record label that yeah who was on that bands label? like uh, the clean and right. uh, the lanes and the chills it's just like a <clears throat> yeah a, the dunedin sound as it's called yeah that's you know that was that was sort of the uh but that that's very, uh, you know, it's pretty underground. Yeah, and um, it couldn't couldn't be further from the music that you do, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Although, you know, I try and try and uh, try and sort of bring it around from time to time. Yeah, yeah. That was that was definitely, you know, I was aware of them and, and really and appreciated it, but it wasn't wasn't a, didn't sort of hit me in the same way that I, the stuff I was listening to was. Right, and so you moved to Melbourne, Melbourne, mm-hmm. and uh, you and. Delaney kind of put things on hold, or yeah. and then how do you find these guys? The uh, the Arabenders. Yeah, I just need, want to make sure I pronounced it. Yeah, right. <laughs> y- Yara. I don't know. It's a weird one. That's, what does it mean? That's uh, well, Yara is a it's an Aborigine word, um, an Australian word, meaning it flows. Um, it's a it's the name of a river that runs through Melbourne. Okay. And uh, and we all lived around there. Well, three of us did. Right. But yeah, so the, in terms of the band, Ben, the bass player, is, you know, as I said, I've been singing with him since we were 12, mm-hmm. so it's, since we started high, high school together. And Gus was uh, uh, the local barman uh, at the Arrow Hotel. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started a residency there, and by the second gig I had him playing drums behind me, you know, got bored of playing solo. Yeah, And then Dave, uh, who plays guitar I, uh, and violin I knew from New Zealand and had toured with, with Delaney before. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so it was a, uh, yeah, it was, I, I'm not very good at like auditioning strangers or anything. It's, right. Are, are any of the science teachers kicking themselves that they didn't throw their hat in the ring? <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I think they're both still teaching. Really? Uh, Simon, uh, yeah, uh, longest standing science teacher drummer yeah is uh is playing doing some really nice stuff really playing good music oh, that's yeah. great what, yeah. what's his name well he's still playing drums and oh, okay uh, but for this for this uh girl named laura lee and it's really nice okay yeah. all right i'll have to check it out mm. um so you do the first record under your own name and uh, were those i mean how was the arrangement between you and the band as far as guys this is my thing rather than a band yeah. thing and <clears throat> it was tricky you know like going from especially you know with Ben having having the, the unfaithful ways which was a you know like a we we're all obsessed with the band right so it was a sort of equal opportunity sort of thing with multiple songwriters yeah but I I don't know I, I really just was starting to feel a real sense of of self and and you know self direction, especially working with Delaney because he was such a taskmaster of, of his own you know of his own sort of product and and drive. So it was yeah, I think I just I don't know I, yeah, and I had a I had a manager um, like that I met in in New Zealand but lived in Melbourne and so I moved to Melbourne with a manager and and was playing a lot of. For the, for the most part, a lot of solo shows for a long time, mm-hmm. and then it's like, well, I need a band, you know. Mm-hmm. So it was it was part of the, you know, part of the open dialogue that that was what it was. I think. Right, and and those guys are playing on both of the albums, right? Yeah, well, the Ben, Dave, and uh, and Gus aren't playing on the first one. Okay, it's just Ben and uh, and a bunch of my friends from Littleton. Okay, um, and like Elders, and yeah. Uh, and then the second one was yeah we all just went off to California and right did that did it that way 
And, and you did that, this this new album, was it just this past December? No, no, okay, no, I was going to say, yeah, that yeah. is a quick turn. Oh, yeah. No, the yeah. things don't happen that quickly. <laughs> right. I wish. <laughs> so you do this, this you know, heartbreaking breakup record, mm-hmm. and you turn it out pretty quickly, too, right? Yeah. And both in the writing and in the recording, it was a, it was a very uh, dramatic and stressful and emotional couple of months. Yeah. Now I'd imagine doing these songs a year and a year and a change later, mm. it seems like you're at a happier place in your life. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's I I felt happier once I wrote those songs. You yeah, there was there was such a giving away, and you know, and I never I never used music like that until until that album. You know, it's, it was there was never a need, which I think is a bad thing. You know, I think it's bad for art and good for life, but. <laughs> To not have to not have that you know need for tension you know like it's i don't know it's like the the german pot rilke said you know you've got to if there's if you don't need to do it then you shouldn't do it at all right you know, like right. which i always thought was you know some neo-romantic yeah twaddle yeah but uh, you know i can see the uh the fruits of it now right and, and in this solo phase you never do dip back and play any unfaithful ways songs do you no yeah it's no. just too different it feels yeah like. every now and then i think about it but then it's but it's only some sort of silly joke right but. well how did you kind of arrive at uh this sound that which is so, so distinctly different from mm. the band sound i think it's just through it's just through just constant playing and and just subtle shifts that just happen gig after gig and you know and day after day it's 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 really hard to put your finger on mm. um but you know like i remember last year coming back to christchurch and playing hometown gig for the first one for a year or so <clears throat> and one of my good friends coming up and saying oh, i the way you're playing dark child is amazing like, it's really it's what it's way over the top and completely different mm-hmm. and i just had no idea that it had changed at all you know? right right it's such it's such a uh, sort of silent shift that goes on for yeah. me yeah. yeah that that's one of uh it's always interesting i have this game i play with my friends where we'll just like be on the in, an instant message format and mm. uh like one of us will name a band and the other one will say all right I think their top song on Spotify has got to be this, and it's going to be this many million. Yeah. But, like, uh, does it surprise you that Dark Child is one of the most popular songs? Not really, no. Yeah. It's, I mean, I didn't write that song. No? For, for, for her, yeah, that's, that was written by a friend of mine. Okay. Um, in Christchurch. It was it's such a good song. I just knew it was, uh, you know, and, I, and I, the way I just sort of, the way it felt to sing it. You know, it's it just felt it felt good, and it mm. felt it felt like I was, I had a straight line to to the heart somehow. Right, right. So it, and it it's really nice it's really nice having, having a you know playing a song that's written by a friend of yours and and a, you know because he doesn't really play much. Right. It's, it's, so this friend doesn't play out. No, no. Did, he's, did, he's a nurse. Really? Yeah. Did he re- ever record a version that's out there? Or? There's like there's one version of him playing it on the guitar. Yeah. Like on, on like Vimeo or something. Wow, that's wild. Yeah, but it's yeah. So how did it come that you would? How did you come to approach him and realize that you wanted to do that song? I don't know. It was a mix of things. It was I just didn't have enough songs. Yeah. For my album, for starters. Okay. And we, I don't know. We 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 we're really good friends, and we're always playing around Christchurch. And it just I don't know. I think just things were. I was really put, making a push for it musically. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed like a, the right thing to do, you know, to a degree. Right. And I just wanted that song. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did you do anything different enough so you could get a co-writer credit? <laughs> I, check this out. This is the most business, like, shark thing I've ever done. Yeah. I, uh, I'm probably getting in trouble for this too, I'm going to say it anyway. I bought him out of 10% of the song. Yeah. For $250. Right. So that I could submit it for a... New Zealand public funding application. Okay. And got the funding. Yeah. And it was like the most sharky thing I've ever done in my life. Ah, uh, it's but, not that bad. I mean, it's, I think it's <laughs> it, fine. I think yeah. it's actually within within the uh, remit, but it's a bit bit dodgy. Right. I mean, you hear like well, who's the guy who wrote uh, 
Breathless, Otis Blackwell, I think. Oh, right. Yeah, and he wrote, like, all of Elvis's hits. And uh, somebody said, like, man, you're letting Elvis get credit on these songs. And he's like, well, 50% of something is better than 0% of nothing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's, he's yeah, like, well, yeah, it's a pretty mercenary way of looking at it. But yeah, but he's getting royalty checks. Exactly. Your friend's getting royalty checks. Yeah, he is, checks, yeah. And that's yeah. nice. Yeah. So you're in this phase of your career, you're doing the solo thing. By now you must realize this is a career, right? Or are you still? You know, yeah, I guess, you know, it's, I don't have a job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or not, uh, any other job, I should say. You know, it's, yeah. By, by the time, by about a year into living in Melbourne, it was, you know, I was, there was no room for anything else. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah. Right. And over this time since since the album have you guys been working on new stuff for another release or nah it's I, yeah i haven't written anything since really no really no not a thing what are you gonna do <laughs> i don't know that remains to be seen yeah nothing no no just not a messing around on this you know i didn't between the the my 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 two albums i didn't write anything at all either really no it just there were heaps of ideas in my head and then, and now i've got you know i've got ideas but right. it is, i'm pretty superstitious about committing things to paper interesting yeah so do you think that it, it might not have been you know it, it sounds like it was a, a rush of inspiration that you got all those songs out on mm. this album but there might have been some level of them being ready at the dam about about to burst yeah and, uh, yeah it's a tricky thing to try and work out yeah subconscious stuff but interesting yeah. if you went into a studio now with like okay you got to make another record is, is that how it would work do you think or <clears throat> i'd like to spend more time making a record yeah like being in the studio because i went like we did the, this one in 10 days and we did the last one in probably i think less yeah actually spend a couple of months or something mm -hmm. yeah just with with a you know just demoing and then slowly building things right so so that's probably going to be the i think so yeah. yeah i'd like it to be do you feel like you've written your legacy song yet you know the song that people will remember you by uh no there's no accounting for what you know what people will grab on to what's from into the future but what's the last song in your set it's a screaming joe hawkins song okay Portrait of a what's Man. the last original song in your set uh at the moment it's the one before that which is uh love is a terrible thing right yeah which is just i don't know it just sort of works well with me playing the piano and mm. sort of giving a little sort of jazz standardy sounding song right right but um you know i think that that song, the duet I do with Elvis Harding, nobody gets what they want anymore. Is uh, it's the one that that was the most edifying. You know, it's the one that I actually learnt from from writing, and and feel and I feel it gives an expression to something that you, I can't express using ordinary language, and that's that's the closest I think. Yeah, that's the closest thing to success I've I've felt as a songwriter. That's great. I feel like it is evident in that song that there's like there are chord changes that like don't need to happen but they do happen they make it that much better mm. you know it's like the ding ding, ding like a, going from major to minor and yeah yeah I was listening to a lot of Paul McCartney I think yeah was. is that what it was <laughs> yeah but listening to the new album like one thing that one song that I kept thinking of well, and I don't know why but was Wicked Game does, oh yeah does that play into your <clears throat> You know, totally. background at all. Yeah, yeah. That's that song is uh I don't know, it's something of an archetype for me. You know? It is, okay. Yeah. So I wasn't way off. No, not okay. at all. You know, it's there's that mix of nostalgia and you know, just, and but imbued with, with that directness too, you know, it's it's using old materials for a you know, a new and direct message to someone. Right. And yeah, I, I like that description of wicked game kind of also doubling as what you do kind of a yeah yeah older ways of saying something new yeah yeah, yeah. It's, you know it's it's just nostalgia is just another tool you know to yeah draw people in i think 
Nostalgia is just a tool to draw people in, says Marlon Williams. And Marlon Williams does find older ways to say something new and new ways to say something timeless. Check him out this summer. He's touring Europe with his band, the Yara Benders. Check out his dates on marlinwilliams.co.nz and check us out at online.berkeley.edu slash take note. Special thanks this episode to Tim Schull, Andrew Walls, and Gabriel Reifer Cohen. And thanks to you for listening. And keep an ear out for our crowdfunding podcast, which is coming later this summer. Join us next month for a very special interview with Taj Mahal. Talk to you then.